Good day. This is Dr. Ron McFarland with Higher Vista, and we're going to talk about the introduction to cloud computing services. Now, the premise of this whole series of cloud computing uh, presentations, this being number one, is that you can use these presentations to understand a bit more about cloud computing services in general, or you might be using it for a certification exam. So you're free to use these as you see fit, certainly. If you do use them in an educational environment, just refer to Higher Vista. That's the only thing that we're going to request that you do. Um, and if you use any of our content for outside presentations, let's say within an organization that you're working for, or if you're going to present at a conference and you use this as a snippet, if you will, please also just refer to Higher Vista LLC as the source and we're good to go. Thank you. I, we do want to present items free, if you will, to support the technology community, especially IT, cybersecurity, and digital forensics. It's our pleasure to do so. So let's get started on this presentation. So what we'll discuss, we'll define what cloud computing is. Some additional terms. Now, the reason I'm mentioning these, for example, are terms that you should not only know, but if you're working in an organizational environment with a user group, you want to clarify certain aspects to them. So you're still talking apples to apples, and so they're not looking at you as some sort of gearhead uh, with three eyes, if you will four eyes in my case. So we're going to look at that. Essential characteristics of cloud computing. There's five of those. We'll look at what those characteristics are. And that char characteristics kind of describe the cloud environment, if you will. There's three service models that we'll look at as well. Now to kind of wrap up this first presentation, in subsequent presentations, we'll go over more detail of this. But this should get you started. And uh, about every couple of days, we'll put a new cloud um, presentation out. Defining cloud computing. Now, I'm going to take this from straight from the NIST, National Institute of Science and Technology. It does a lot of documentation for uh, the federal government and provides use cases, a lot of really deep dive on a lot of technology, compliance items, digital forensics, cybersecurity issues, if you will. So the NIST 800-145 is really kind of one of the foundational aspects, documents for cloud computing. Now, if we look at this, it's one sentence definition, but it's really thick. It's a model for enabling ubiquitous, convenient, on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources. That's cloud computing. And that is a big definition. So we're going to te tease apart each one of those aspects in not only this presentation, but future presentations. So what they're talking about, networks, servers, storage, application services can be provisioned um, almost ad hoc. And we'll talk a little more about that as we go through this series. And um, with minimal management effort or service provider interaction. Now, here's the interrelated terms for cloud computing, five essential characteristics, three service models, and a four deployment model. Five characteristics, on-demand self-service, broad network access, we'll clarify a little more what that means. Resource pooling, so that's where you kind of pull resources that others can share with you. Rapid elasticity, whether it expands or shrinks, and some sort of measurement of service that you're getting. Uh, three service models, software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. Four deployment models, public, think of the public library, private, right? so it's more closely held. A community, it's shared, or hybrid, some sort of mix of the above three. Additional terms, and I mentioned this, application. Application is one of those squishy terms. I can say application, and my users would look at me kind of cross-eyed. Well, I have to explain what I'm meaning in terms of that word application. So within the context of cloud computing, application can refer to cloud-enabled SaaS, software as a service. It could refer to a web application, maybe a mobile application, or an application that exists on a virtual machine. It could even be an application, a legacy application, really, that you're associating with cloud services somehow. So that needs to be cleared up with the users. So not only do you understand what you're talking about with applications, certainly you would, but just so you don't steer your users bonkers, because they might be thinking in terms of, oh, that Linux application that's running on a virtual instance, how's that associated with the cloud? Clarify that with, to them before we get into the thick of it. 
The as a service, as I mentioned before, it implies that you're using cloud. So anything you see AAS as a service is supporting those five essential characteristics of cloud computing. And we'll look at them in, again in a second. The cloud infrastructure, here's another SP, NIST SP 500-292 that talks about, uh, I don't want to say ad nauseum, but with a good amount of detail. And we need that detail. Matter of fact, if you are studying for a cert related to any kind of cloud certification, Cloud Plus from CompTIA or uh, the CCSP cert from ISC Squared or any other cert that does rely on cloud, they're going to refer to the CCRA, which is the Cloud Computing Reference Architecture. And that really go, does a deep dive on how the cloud is provisioned, how it's set up, how we use it, if you will. So again, the cloud infrastructure, as a definition, is a collection of hardware and software that enables the five essential characteristics of cloud computing. Look at that. The term cloud service versus cloud service model means one or more capabilities offered to you individually or the organization via the cloud computing model. So you can say cloud service. Again, this is one of those areas where when I'm talking to users, I always talk about what cloud service they're getting. So cloud service ends up being a generic term that also needs to be clar clarified, if you will. So the essential characteristics, I noted those be before, but let's do a little bit of a deep dive. They're on-demand self-service, provision them on-demand, Broad network access, we'll look at some aspects of that. Resource pooling, and whenever I think of resource pooling, I have to get my cybersecurity hat on, there's a little bit of a red flag, and I say, how are you slicing and dicing that? Uh, rapid elasticity, how are you flexing that environment? Are you shrinking it up during certain periods of the day or the month or quarter or annually? Are you expanding those? And measure, is it CapEx, OpEx? By the way, in our series, we're going to discuss a little bit more about CapEx and OpEx, capital expense versus operational expense. Multi-tenant, think of a one, think of a something like an apartment build. You've got one structure. But you have multiple tenants, and each one of those tenants are isolated by the walls of their apartment, if you will. So that's kind of a, an analogy. Cloud services can be, but generally are, multi-tenant architecture. A multi-tenant architecture is one in which a single computing resource, maybe those resources are shared, but logically isolated to serve multiple consumers. The service model, again, you see on the bottom, SAAS. P-A-A-S, I-A-A-S. A uh, service model is a categorization of cloud computing services. The highest level categorization of cloud services is based on the type of computing capability that is provided. So what they're saying here, and this is from NIST, is that our, uh, if you're looking at software as a service, your focus is on the software. A CRM, we use Salesforce in our business. So software, that's the software as a service. Is it provision sharing other other folks? Yeah, but we're sort of isolated from the others. A platform as a service, the platform is the biggest concern in that environment. Or is it infrastructure as a service? What we'll do is talk about each one of these flavors and some of the variations that you may see that pull up underneath, if you will, that are subordinate to SaaS, PaaS, or IaaS. We'll look at those in, in future presentations. A deeper dive into service models. Now, I've got some things highlighted here. I've also noted the NIST SP 800-145. I'll let that dash out there. On-demand service model and provisioning of computing capabilities, such as server, time, network storage. That's the service model without requiring human interaction. Now, there's variations on that. Of course, there are. So it makes it so complex, if you will. This is straight from this. I've highlighted only a couple of essential items on here. Um, option A versus option B in this bit of an eye chart, if you will. Option A is fully automated ser service provisioning. So it's fully automated versus option B where the CSE, and that stands for Cloud Service Consumer Customer, if you will, uh, uses an automated interface uh, but the provider may use some sort of manual labor. How that really works is option A is really talking about if you go out to AWS, just as a student or someone who's just trying it out, you can provision things right at your fingertips using basically a web browser, if you will, into AWS. That's pretty automatic. That's option A. Option B, you might have a larger organizational environment and you want to spin up some uh, special this gets into a whole bunch of compliance items, but if you want to spin up a special secure 
uh, network tried, uh, the organization may take your request first, and they would have somebody in the back end setting that up for you. And maybe a day later, they say, you're good to go. You've got, you know, 90% of it was automatically done. The other 10% we had to manually configure. So that's what they're talking about between option A and B. CSC and, and consumer in the red down below are uh, synonymous terms, a cloud service consumer, customer, and a consumer, same thing. So NIST uses those terms interchangeably, and I wanted to highlight that in particular. Computing capabilities in NIST, they're talking about server applications, server time, network storage, those type of things that, would, that all are endemic with cloud services. Broad network access service model has capabilities are available over the network and access through standard mechanisms that promote use by heterogeneous thin or thick client platforms. Option A over the internet, option B over the network that is available from all access points uh, the CSC requires. What they're saying is me in my home environment, I can provision something, no problem, use a web browser, provision AWS, Azure, uh, Oracle, database, cloud services, etc. No problem there. On the organizational side, you generally don't want things just wide open on browsers to have people internally um, access anything they want to externally. There's a cybersecurity issue. So as a network engineer, what you might do, what a network engineer might do, they cluster off certain aspects of the network that may be more secure. They don't want any outside interfaces. They put that data behind a firewall. And they may have some other options where a certain group of users can have access. Maybe they're using Microsoft Active Directory to say just the engineering group gets out to uh, the AWS services. So they're, they're carving out a little slice of who can have access to that. So if you look at option B, available over the network that is available from all access point the CSC requires. So I, I'm thinking the CSC defines, if you will. And in terms of thin or thick, if you've seen the red part there in the middle, it's included as a criteria since it includes all clients. They're not saying thin or thick. That's not a requirement. They're just saying that's part of the whole ethos, if you will. And they're calling out the standard mechanisms, standard port 80, port 8080, those are all standard, HTTP, HTTPS, 443, port 40, REST, TCP IP, UDP, and other internet protocols based on the service provider. Now, the service provider uh, may only use 443, so you could say, well, we're going to let the engineering group uh, go through 443, et cetera, and kind of narrow that scope. But that is something that you get together with your service provider. Anytime, any place, access to computing resources. That's kind of the notion of having um, things provisioned over the Internet or a little slice of who has access in your organization to cloud services. That's what we're looking for. We want that ease of use. Resource pooling. Again, I pull up the red flag. If it's cybersecurity, you have to be careful of how you're doing pooling of resources. For most instances, uh, resource pooling, you are sharing resources. Think of an apartment, um, Office 365. Um, if I'm in a home environment, I might be sharing Office 365 uh, with half a million other customers that are using it. I've got my own little separate apartment, my own separate instance of 365. But when Microsoft decides to do the update, we all get that same update. We're sharing, we're caring, that sort of thing. So computing resources are pooled, pooled to serve multiple customers. Location independence, the storage, processing, memory, and network, those are all the resource pooling items that we need to look at. If we're in cybersecurity, we want to kind of scratch our head and say, how's that memory being provisioned? How's that network being provisioned? How's it storage? But generally, uh, quite frankly, if we're in a home environment, we're not that concerned, generally speaking. So those are some items that we'll key on as we go forward. Looking at the NIST documentation, again, I call that location independence. Uh, those examples of resources are storage, processing, memory, and network bandwidth. Again, those are the flexibility, if you will, that, uh, um, uh, that we can either expand or contract, but these are the fundamental resource pulling items. Uh, can serve multiple tenants. Resource pulling is an inherent benefit of any service model, such as SAS, PaaS, or IaaS. 
that is hosted on the cloud infrastructure. And certainly resource pooling lowers the cost of by sharing resources. And I'll put a little caveat, could increase the cybersecurity risk profile. So we'll look at that a little bit later on as well. A rapid elasticity, I mentioned this already, again, coming from the SP800-145. Again, scaling up and down. Uh, actually, if you want, I'll read this through because it, uh, this is actually on the CCSP and also the Cloud Plus exam. Elastically provisioned and released, so you can acquire or release. In some cases, automatically, again, some cases, or it needs to be manually done to scale rapidly outward and inward commensurate with the demand. What if you are doing quarterly processing, like real heavy duty? And in the old school way, you'd buy a server, buy a, some sort of storage device, NAS, or what have you, and you'd have that, and you'd build it for demand. So it's used three or four, five months out of the year. The rest of the time, it kind of lays fallow. or not as used as much. So you're really paying a high capital expense for something that may be used 80, 90, 100% during the peak moments, but maybe it's, it goes back to 10 or 15% during those. So that would be a capital expense versus operational expense. You're essentially leasing uh, the provision space. You can release that as you need or call it back when you do need it. Thereby, operational expense sometimes is a savings overall. So rapid elasticity relates to as you are expanding, that's horizontal scaling. We'll talk about vertical scaling a little bit later on. Quickly grow and shrink the computing capacity. Again, think OPEX versus CAPEX when you're buying stuff, the capital expense. Measured service management. The CFO in my company loves to measure everything. So with cloud systems, you can automatically control and optimize resources by leveraging some sort of metering capability. Whether it's measuring who's using the resource, how long, or, or you're just saying, uh, we're going to do a billing based on your use, utilization of the cloud services that everyone in the company is using, but your department's using it 70%, well, you get 70% of the bill. But there also could be other compelling reasons for measuring that service. Let's say all of a sudden you see a huge spike, and you can measure that. And if you all of a sudden you see a huge spike in some sort of cloud-based services, you may automatically decide on your ACLs or some other uh, services that you have to shut down those ports or that service because you might say, wait, that's way out of the norm. Something's happening. we got to shut that interface down in order to investigate what's going on. So that measuring not only deals with CapEx, OpEx, but it could be a security measure that you're using. Resource usage can be monitored, controlled, and reported. So looking at the NIST, metering is done at on a pay-per-use or charge-per-use basis. Again, you're, you're essentially leasing or paying for that particular usage. That gets into the operational expense. Metering may be used to show how organizational within a private cloud. Let me go back to the private cloud aspect. If you have a cloud on-prem that you've set up, and let's say you've got multiple divisions, uh, you're spread out throughout the country, and you've got a private cloud, so the organizational leadership can use that measured service to see how much that resource is maybe being used by the folks down in Fort Lauderdale versus the folks up in Utah. So they can use that to scale and also to measure the cost back, charge back, if you will. And all of that can be controlled. The control aspect is all of a sudden, again, if you see a spike, that could be something where you would want to shut it down. Or maybe not. Maybe you, when you do see a spike and it's a normal spike in processing, maybe you go ahead and set something up to provision additional resources to support that spike. So what we covered in this brief video is, number one, uh, what defining what cloud service computing is, the essential characteristics of cloud computing, the three service models, and the four deployment models. Additional terms. Now, this is where you want to provide some sort of clarification to uh, your users. That's how I often use this. We talked about application, the AAS. You may need to clarify that with the users because they may be selecting a model. And if they, if they have the other options available, they may say, well, we can live with that option because the cost could be more beneficial or the security may be more beneficial on a particular instance. And we'll talk about security and also the resource allocation. We talked about what cloud infrastructure is, 
and what a cloud service is. So that those items you may need to clarify to your users. The essential characteristics of cloud computing, as well as the service models were also highlighted. So I hope you've enjoyed this brief overview. Uh, feel free to drop any questions to Window. This will be posted on YouTube as well. So feel free to contact us. So please enjoy. Let us know what you think. And thank you so much. Mm -hmm.